Let's give folks a couple of examples of processed versus ultra processed. So like dried fruit is processed. Sure. Um, Virtually everything we eat is processed. Yeah, every almost everything you eat is processed. But then, how do you draw the? How do you then cross the chasm to ultra processed? Yeah, again, I don't know that there. Uh, even if you say there's a single definition like Nova, I can't recite for you the exact criteria. But it's the, it's the number of steps, it's the degrees of steps, it's the types of steps. But, but most things that come in a package are now viewed as ultra processed. That's right. It's it's there are more there are more number steps of ingredients pack, and number of ingredients number of steps but you're right dried fruit even fruit that's cut up is processed um, uh, wine is processed cheese is processed milk is homogenized uh, sometimes it's pasteurized hopefully uh, you know almost everything we eat is processed now let's talk about the state of the evidence because again a good a good story goes a long way right. I mean, our ancestors, and to be clear, I, my view on this is that the story is much more nuanced than the one I'm about to lay out, but, but the one I'm about to lay out makes sense and I get it. Um, we didn't evolve eating ultra processed foods, let alone processed foods and ultra processed foods are engineered to be highly palatable and part of that engineering process also makes them calorie dense because part of making things hyper palatable is putting in a lot of sugar and a lot of fat. So it's not that the food companies who make these things are trying to make us fat. They're not trying to hurt us. They're not, I mean, Marlboro's not trying to hurt you with cigarettes. They just want you to smoke them forever. Um, or um, so so. Um, it's an unfortunate consequence of the product, right? So, so they really want to create something that tastes remarkable that you just want to keep buying over and over again. And the problem is you're going to end up eating more of it in terms of calories because of the very nature of the product they're trying to sell you. So clearly this is a problem, right? It's, we, we can't have these foods around because we can't eat them in moderation. We're going to overeat them. And I don't think any, but this is one thing we can agree on, right? Is overconsumption of calories always leads to bad things relative to what your needs are, right? So again, that number is variable by, by individual, but um, for any given individual, eating more than they require leads to physiologic harm. So by that logic, why are we having this discussion? Why don't we just get rid of ultra processed foods? There's not a right, there's not a correct definition of ultra processed. You can define it any way you want. The words mean what they say, we say they mean. Once you've defined it clearly, then we can say, what's its value? What is it? How can we use it? What's its utility? Second thing I would say is, as with any category, if it permits a lot of variability in that category, which ultra processed certainly does, it starts to get a little silly to talk about the overall category because you say, so wait a minute, you want me to consider a meal replacement shake in the same category as I consider a big gulp in a 7-Eleven, in the same category I consider a chocolate bar, in the same category I consider a TPN nutrition. You know, these are all arguably ultra processed and very different things. And I think we want to talk about the things. The next thing I want to bring up is what are we trying to do with it? And this is probably the intellectually most important. If you say to me, David, what I am looking for is a heuristic, and this loops back to something I said we'd address later, or earlier I mentioned, I said we'd come back to it. The distinction between how much protein do I think somebody ought to eat for a certain goal versus how would I tell them to eat it or what would I tell them about it? And those are two different things. If you said, David, I just want something I can tell people. So that when I tell them this, it has a beneficial effect. Does telling them not to eat ultra processed foods or to eat as few of them as possible, defining ultra processed in this way, help? And the answer is might help a lot. Depends on how you, you know, might might vary a little bit depending on how you said it. We need more studies. We need to figure out. My guess is, as with everything else, it won't last long, right? So you could tell them not to drink sugar-sweetened beverages. You could tell them not to eat fettuccine Alfredo because it's a heart attack on a plate. All these things, you know, have a small effect for a while and usually not so much for a long term, but might help. 
We need to study that, okay? That says nothing, however, about the effects of the food per se. If you said, no, David, my goal is to tell people about the foods they should eat. If they actually ate them, what the effects would be, or my goal is to determine the effects of foods. Then I would go back to a statement from a wonderful book called A Fly in the Ointment by someone named Joe Schwartz. And Dr. Schwartz, who's a food scientist, um, says something like, there is a motto, repeat after me, the effect of substances in the body depends on their molecular structure, not their ancestry. So if you give me this molecule or a collection of them to eat, and you extracted that molecule from some berry and it's natural, or you synthesize that molecule in a laboratory, but in the end, it's the same molecule. We agree. I mean, you could try to synthesize it might have some slight difference, but let's assume it's literally the same molecule and it's the same structure. You know, you give it to me in liquid form and liquid form or gaseous form or whatever it is. If you say these are going to have different effects because of where they came from, seems to me we're in homeopathy now. This makes no sense. Yeah. And a, my favorite example of this is natural sugar versus uh, processed sugar, which is, I don't know if the people who say this are ignorant of what fructose and glucose are, or if it's deliberate sort of marketing shenanigans. I think it's a mixture of deliberate marketing shenanigans, but it's also the marketing of ideas, not just food products, by people with particular philosophical and other bents who are anywhere from, you know, the interest to make themselves famous, to push a philosophical thing, to push an anti-industry thing, whatever it is. Um, but yes, I agree with that. Or, you know, there, and there's so many others, natural vanillin versus synthetic vanillin. If it's still vanillin, it's vanillin. There's a wonderful book by Alan Levinovitz called Natural, in which he will blow away every common conception of what natural is uh, and what its value is. And he talks about the idea of, you know, lots of people want the natural vanillin, natural vanilla. Most of the vanilla flavoring we get in this country is not so-called natural from the vanilla plant. But if it was, it would probably have a much worse environmental impact than the other sources. So it's not always so simple. In any case, I think Schwartz is right. It's not the ancestry. So whether you give me the molecule and it was locally grown or not locally grown, organic or not organic, ultra processed or not ultra processed, it's the molecules and their structure that matter. Conditional upon the molecules and the structure doesn't matter where it came from. But in defense of the argument that ultra processed foods must be worse, if you look at the ingredient list, David, the sheer number of molecules there would suggest, we're playing Russian roulette here, I don't recognize half the names of the things on the bag of Doritos. Like, I don't know what they are I'm making that up. I, I haven't looked at a bag of Doritos in a while, but you could certainly find an ultra processed food at the grocery store in which you cannot comprehend 50% of what's in it. That's right. And you don't really know the dose either, because the only thing that the FDA requires is that you list them in order of abundance. But it could be that the first one sure. represents 99% of it, and the other 12 represent 1% of it. And even amongst that, there's an uneven distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And it could be that these are just preservatives and color additives, and they have no physical bearing, but, but you just don't know. So, right. but, but the point is, when I eat an apple, or even if I eat a processed apple in the sense that it's been pre-cut up or it's just a dried apple that's, you know, dried apple chips where I can look at the ingredient list and it says apples. Um, I got to be safer than if I'm eating, come on, 20 things of which I can't pronounce 13 of them. If that's the logic of your thinking, I have a great product I'd like to sell you. Uh, it's gluten-free, it's uh, seed oil-free, it's uh, not ultra-processed, uh, it's free of any 
harmful thing. It's chemical free. It has no chemicals in it. I call it vacuum. And I would like to sell you this vacuum. And uh, basically, that means nothing because we are chemicals. As my friend Ferg Clydesdale, who is the former uh, head of the nutrition food science department at um, uh, UMass Amherst, used to say, the whole purpose of eating is to get chemicals into the body to replace the chemicals the body loses through the process of living. All food is chemicals. We are chemicals. When you eat that apple and you say, I understand it, that's apple, unless you have a lot of chemical knowledge I don't have and most people don't have, you don't understand that any better than you understand something else that says benzoate phosphate or what have you in it. You just think you do because you think you understand what an apple is at a chemical level. You understand what is at a fruit level, maybe, but not at a chemical level. There is many chemical, or actually many, there are many chemicals in an apple and an orange that you or I couldn't pronounce and that if someone wrote out what the chemicals are, uh, we would say, what is that scary sounding thing? Um, and we also know that things that we think of as natural can be just as harmful, right? Foxglove, uh, hemlock, right? Socrates killed by being forced to drink all natural hemlock. It was all natural, very harmful. So poisons, drugs often come from natural things. There's also a misperception that what we think of as natural is somehow has been around for thousands of years. And in some cases it's true. Uh, in many cases it's not. So the oranges and the apples and, and the grains uh, that you're eating today were largely not around years ago. They've been bred, even if it's not transgenic, they've been bred by ordinary breeding things. The cows, the chickens, the pigs have been bred to be different. They are not indigenous species. All the chicken, all the cow, all the pig uh, that we eat in this country, the soybeans, none of that's indigenous. They're all invasive species, right? Um, turkey. That's indigenous to North America. Pecans and black walnuts, but not the other walnuts that they love so much in the Mediterranean diet over there. They're not American. So I think this is all silliness. The only thing that's artificial here is our, our creation of these categories, and we should just recognize that we create the categories. Let's make them meaningful and useful. Uh -huh.